Hello, everyone. I'm Kamran. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast. A safe space for termagant melophobes and people that don't butter their toast alike. Also the home of the Glenn Close Effect. Today, we are excited to introduce a new series to our audience. This is the first episode of our coverage of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. We begin with the first book in the series, Gardens of the Moon. We are covering the prologue and book one, chapter one today. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the book series in the Malazan universe. This is not a book review, and it is not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Know that we both think this series is the best story ever written, and that we will not be providing literary critique. Correct. <laughs> we will be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that have not read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. Right, right. And our goal is to explore this universe together and to help explain some of the things that may be confusing to first-time readers. Yeah, I would like to explore this in a way that allows me to determine exactly what it is that makes me think this is the best story ever told. Agreed. Early on in this book, a lot is being introduced, and we can't go into too much detail due to the risk of ruining some key plot points. Due to this, the early conversations may appear more like a Cliff's Notes version of the story. As the story progresses, we will have much more freedom to dive into the content and explore some of the topics. Now, this series has some adult themes, and it is not recommended for children. Yes, but it is certainly not as... uh, vulgar or <laughs> right. deviant no, as the boys so. it's mostly just hatefully violent more than anything else you know yeah there are one or two things that come up over the books that really push it but also we'll, yeah. we'll give warnings prior to that yeah yes now we do need to take a moment to talk about pronunciation yes this is my fourth read through of the series internally i have always pronounced malazin as Malazan. Billy informed me that Steven Erickson himself has confirmed that this is the correct pronunciation, and this was relatively recently that I found out about it. Yes, but he pronounces the island of Malaz, or Malaz, or not, no, he doesn't say Malaz, like he would say Malazan. It's mm-hmm. Malaz. This is Malaz. Uh, uh, Malaz or Malaz. And so mm-hmm. I, I, I will lean on my Malazan. <laughs> Because mm-hmm. if he says Laz, I'm going with him. So, okay. so I, I, it's my, it, it's a Malazan. It's not, it's not Malaz. I say that. The Ralph Lister thing has me confused. I'm sorry, for, for readers um, um, or for listeners, the uh, audible books of the series, this gentleman, Ralph Lister, does the whole series brilliantly, I might add. And he pronounces the way, the way that we do, Malazan. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm confused by this because this is certainly something I would have thought Amazon and all of their greatness <laughs> um, would have um, <laughs> no, would have swatted there. <laughs> yeah, it, it does kind of muddy the waters a bit. But if Steven Erickson's saying it that way, you know, I'm going to work hard on that. It is what it is. It is what it is. Thank you. Yeah, and so as difficult as it is for me to make this change, just because of repetition, yes. right? I'm so used to saying it a certain oh, way. If we slip, uh, it's it's yeah. It, it, forgive us if we slip. And then, yes. Additionally, as far as other names go, will adjust is required. Thank yes. you for your understanding. <laughs> yes. And, and and Mr. Erickson, we do hope that one day you would like to come and make sure that we are correct in our pronunciation of everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Always an open invitation. <laughs> yes. Yes. We appreciate the autographs, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> the one thing, I don't know if we've said enough, and maybe I sh- we should warn, this book does, uh, Comron says it introduces a bunch of stuff. That's better put like this. You're dunked into the pool. (laughs) Actually, you're thrown in the middle of a giant ocean, and it's like you've got to kind of figure it out, but it's worth – don't don't let it overwhelm you. There's going to be a lot of people. It's going to be very exciting. Trust me. Don't worry that we're going to – because it's going to – like Comrade said, we're going to be introducing a bunch of stuff real quick. Don't worry about it. (laughs) This is part of the series. This is part of it. Yeah, and we're going to help people keep everything straight. Absolutely. Yeah. We begin the book with the prologue, which starts in 1154 Burn's sleep. What is Burn, you may ask, this measure of time? Burn is the lady of the earth, the sleeping goddess. It has been 1154 years since she was awake. And we're going to keep a timeline throughout the series, and we will keep Burn's sleep as the measure that we kind of track against. There are other calendars in the series and we'll tie them to burn sleep as best we can to keep track of yes. when things are happening. Cause it, it does 
throughout the series become a little bit unclear at some points what point in time things are happening. So we'll try yes. and keep that all straight. And the, yeah, because we cover this series covers some epochs, a major epochs of time, hundreds of thousands of years. Amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, sorry, right. I'm getting all excited and nerd void. <laughs> it's the it's the nerd Gen Z Amy's getting all like I told you about leaning mm -hmm. back in my chair. I'm not leaning back in my chair. I'm still like all jacked up, leaning forward. So. <laughs> <laughs> The prologue takes place on Malaz Island at Moxhold. The island of Malaz sits southeast of the continent of Kwantali. Kwantali holds the majority of the Malazan Empire. It is from here that the Malazans project their forces onto other continents. Seven Cities and Genabacus are two examples that will be mentioned in this book. When I first read the series, I didn't do a very good job of paying attention to geography. Me either. I will have a larger focus on it during this read through. It's amazing to see the foresight that went into planning the storyline. When you look at the little Easter eggs that are currently on the maps in Gardens of the Moon, and mm. when you, you're you done with the series and you come back, you're like, oh my gosh, this place that we went to, that was on the map in the first <laughs> book. Know you know? It's yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. And see, I, I had the fortune of, again, you introducing me to the series after it's completed. So I, there was no waiting. I mean, this is the first thing mm -hmm. I bought digitally on the Kindle. And I dove right in. And I was like, oh, my goodness, this is amazing. This is amazing. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah. On the island of Malaz, there are riots in the Mouse Quarter, which is the poorest district in Malaz City. We are introduced to the noble boy, Ganos Paran, who is 12 years old, and Commander Whiskey Jack of the Emperor's Third Army, the Bridge Burners. They are in Moxhold, overlooking the city and can see the smoke from the riots in the distance. I heard, I'm not sure, I'm, I, it's Gano S or Ganos. I heard a, a Lister says Gano S. I don't know if that's, we don't use his first okay. name enough anyhow. So, so. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> I apologize. That's the pronunciation number one. <laughs> The third army is identified as the, yeah, here, here from here I, I on apologize. out, we're going to be going, no, no, don't apologize. From here on out, he will be called Paran, so it doesn't matter. Uh, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, The third oh, army wrong. is identified as the elites of the emperor, his favorite army, if you will. You're right. Paran asked Whiskey Jack about Dasim Ultor's reported death at Egatan, which is a city on the seven cities continent 3,000 leagues away. That's roughly 9,000 miles. Put that in perspective. Oh, that's about 8,846 miles from Texas to Vietnam. Man, it's a big world. It's a big world. Yeah. And when we look at the, the map of this world, that distance between the island of Malaz and Seven Cities doesn't really look that far. So it's a very large world. Yeah. That's what I'm assuming. I, I, I'm assuming there's a bunch off the map. No, I found one where some people consolidated everything onto oh, one map. Nice. Okay. Yeah. And it looks pretty extensive. Nice. Dasim Ultor is the first sword of the Empire. We'll become more familiar with these titles as the story progresses a little bit. There's a lot okay. of this kind of stuff. First sword, shield anvil, you know, just, yes. just different a bunch titles. Of strange yeah, we'll get into that. Mm-hmm. I do have an anecdote to tell about the first sword. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> there was a massively multiplayer game that came out called Star Wars The Old Republic. And okay. my friends and I, this was after I start, I read this series for the first time. My friends and I formed a guild. We decided that we were going to have like a little dueling club. And the person <laughs> that beat everybody was going to be the first sword. And this was, okay. you know, I got it from this, this book, right? <laughs> right. So my friend T and I, decided that we were going to duel each other. This is Star Wars. We went to Tatooine okay. and we were <laughs> dueling next to the pit of the Sarlacc. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I was going to lose, but I had this ability. We were both dark, dark side naturally. Of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was this uh, class called the juggernaut and I had a knockback. So I knocked T back off out of the dual zone and into the pit of the Sarlacc and ended up <laughs> nice. beating him. You both I was going to lose. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, he, he was not happy with me after that. 
Yeah. That's amazing. I'm sorry, T, if you're listening. <laughs> he's still pissed about it. I, are you still yeah. sore about that? I'm so, I, I, that's great. Yeah, no, he's, he's, he's still mad about it. Yeah. No, not you. But I, that's great. I'm sorry, T, oh, yeah. if you're listening. Are you yeah, still okay, sore about yeah. that? Sorry, brother. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think I had to abdicate because he said it wasn't fair. <laughs> and so I was going to lose. I had to find a way. Love war. <laughs> I had to find a way. That reminds me of another game. I'll, I'll bring up. I'll bring up a sword fighting game. I think the greatest fighting game of all time was on the PlayStation One. There was a sword fighting game called Bushido Blade. There is no oh, lifeline. Yeah. Did you mm-hmm. play Bushido Blade? I I've never played it, but I heard of it. It's like one hit kills, oh, right? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. So now you could you could take a couple if you were careful. But I'm real nasty because I tend to not swap around, and we would play until I you know. Is we play it, we practice at my house, and then the, the, it, the practice after we were done degenerated into beer drinking and playing Bushido Blade or Tekken or something. Mm-hmm. And it was like play until you dethrone somebody. And I would sit there as the old man with the katana, and and you could you could get me, and I would throw sand in your face and stab you. There's all kind of nastiness to that game. It was it was wonderful. So I'm sorry, I'm not against throwing a little sand. If you're Dark Force in particular, please. <laughs> it's like. He's he's sore about that. You had to advocate him, please. You think Vader would have advocated? <laughs> he was going to leave the guild if I didn't. If I oh didn't my go. word! <laughs> oh my goodness! So he oh, advocated on you, did he? <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I mean, yeah, I, was I, gonna I was going to lose. It was like no question <laughs> that I was going to lose. Hey, okay, but you're dark side. I'm proud of you. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. There was no question, man. <laughs> when Star played some of the old Knights of the Old Republic, and when so they, yeah, I, I always dark sided that game. Mm-hmm. Okay, wow. <laughs> so after Paran asks about Dasim Ultor, what a name, by the way. Jeez. Yeah. Whiskey Jack tells Paran, "Such is war." Paran says, "You're with the third. I thought the third was with him in Seven Cities at Egatan. Now put Egatan in your memory because." It, it is a notable location, and yes. we're going to come back to it later in this series. Yes. Yes, it's a very important. Whiskey Jack interrupts Paran, commenting on how they're still looking for Dasim's body, and a merchant's son 3,000 leagues away knows information a select few are supposed to possess. He then warns Paran to keep his knowledge to himself. Paran says, it's said he betrayed a god. Whiskey Jack advises, heed the lesson. Paran asks for clarification. Whiskey Jack tells him, the best life is the one gods don't notice. If you want to live free, live quietly. I actually have that line highlighted. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, it is. It's a similar concept to fame in a way. Very much so. Yeah, a lot of the famous people, you hear about them talking about not liking being stopped all the time. Oh, (laughs) yeah. That's part of being famous, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, no no anonymity. Yeah, they want it until they don't. You know, Mm -hmm. it's kind of strange. Paran tells Whiskey Jack he wants to be a soldier, a hero. And this is a theme that also we will come back to later. Yeah. Whiskey Jack thinks Paran will grow out of it. Enter the bridge burner Fiddler, who is only a couple of years older than Paran. He has a fiddle strapped to his back, hence the name. And it's broken. It's a broken fiddle. Yeah. Yeah. He's described (laughs) as having pock marks on his hands and face. Do you think this is due to him being a sapper? Or is this too soon for that to have happened? I'm assuming that it has to be a sapper. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. assuming because uh, because uh, I think that they've talked about it. The burn marks, I think, is a very big indication for us. It's stuff we didn't get the first time you read it, of course. But mm-hmm. but yeah, I think so very much. Okay, we'll have to check the timeline though, because I'm wondering if they had that alliance. He's only a, he's only a little bit. How much older is he than Perrin? It says a couple of years, and Prince, uh so four, he's 12, 13 in this? 12. 12. He's got to be 12 because he's yeah. 19. Mm-hmm. He's 12 years old, yeah. So, so he's 12. 15. 14, 15, yeah. Yeah. Let's say 16. We'll say 16. It's, it's amazing the age of everybody in this is so young for the most part. Lot, yeah, I thought they were older at first. The yeah. first time I read this, mm-hmm. I thought that they were a lot older. They do age through the series. Now, we mm-hmm. don't cover a vast time spans. It's only, you know, it's relatively short amount of time. Well, I say that. What's it, about a 10-year, 12-year gap, I think, in total? No, 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 no way. By the end of it, I I, I can't say too much, but some of the right. main characters that were young, they now have gray in their beards, and, you know, 
that may incl- makes me believe it's at least 20 some odd years okay. or more. Uh, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. This, yeah, this is a yeah, it's a con- it's a world spanning war quite quite mm-hmm. literally. <laughs> yeah. Fiddler discusses the riots with Whiskey Jack and how the mages sent in to handle the riots were losing control due to their lack of experience. Of note, he says it's a bad smell when sorcerers panic. And this is an important clue in relation to Fiddler's abilities. Nicely spotted. Mm, thank you. I didn't think about that. <laughs> yeah. The smell of magic. Yeah. They begin to discuss someone named Surly. She has taken control in the Emperor's absence and prohibited the use of sorcery. Surly has taken the name Lacine, which means throne master in her native Napin language. Interestingly, Pran knew what this word meant. His tutor yeah. is also Napin. The island of Nap is directly west of the island of Malas, between it and the continent of Quan Tali. Surly arrives and interrupts the conversation. She is described as having dusky blue skin, which is a Napin trait. She is otherwise plain looking with short hair. Her tone is imperious and cold. Surly is accompanied by two hooded and robed figures. They are members of the Claw, an organization within the Malazan Empire founded by Surly. They are assassins and feared throughout the Empire, as can be seen by Paran's reaction to them. They are described as hiding their hands in their sleeves, and their faces are hidden in the shadows of their hoods. Fiddler is sent away by Whiskey Jack to send Dujek and a wing along with some sappers to assist with the riots and to get the fires under control. Note that Whiskey Jack outranks Dujek, who is taking orders from him. Right. We'll come back okay. to that. Yeah. That a couple of shortly. Yeah. Yeah. In their conversation, Whiskey Jack only refers to her as Surly, refusing to use the new name she has chosen. He remembers when she was just a serving wench in a tavern in the old quarter in Malice City. Did you like Whiskey Jack immediately? I did for some reason, probably some because of the lip. But I also think that it could be the fact that I believe before I had read the series, you had mentioned some character names. And so when I saw these people, they were the first names I had to cling on to. Mm. I knew of your it, particular affiliation and affection for those two in particular, in particular the one fiddler is fit. Mm. fiddler's mind. Yeah. You know, he's almost, uh, he's, yeah, his fiddler's great, dude. All those guys. Bridge burners, man. Dude, bridge burners. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think I, but I, I, when I look, that was one thing I discovered when I looked back on this, when I was looking at some of our shared stuff is that I think I tied some of my initial love to him was because I had heard the name mentioned. I'm like, okay, this is going to be someone I'm going to dig. And it's like, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how you couldn't love that character, Dude, but absolutely. I, it's hard for me to think that far back and, and think about how I was thinking about that character at that time. Yeah. I, yeah. But I, I just looking at him, I have to say, you know, I, I always liked, I think I always liked him yeah. from the beginning. Yeah. Do you know what a whiskey Jack is? No, it's a Canadian J. I'm not sure if it's a bird that steals or not, but I think that derives from a trickster god of the Canadian, I believe the Inuit peoples. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for that. No problem. Surly has some criticism of how Whiskey Jack's troops are handling the insurrection of the magic users in the city. The riots are the result of Surly's decision to outlaw sorcery. Whiskey Jack notes that outlawing of sorcery was Surly's rule, not the emperor's. He hasn't really accepted her taking the throne yet. He still thinks the yes. emperor may return. Yeah. Yeah, the way he's talking to her. Lippy. Yeah. <laughs> Paran is surprised at the tone Whiskey Jack uses to address Lacine, given she created the Claw as an organization. So she's pretty formidable. Yeah. Surly mentions that new transports with recruits have arrived for Whiskey Jack's army. Something happened to the third in seven cities that depleted their ranks. She also tells him that his restless, seditious soldiers will not be missed. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are. Uh... <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> this is important, and you will soon learn more details about this relationship in chapter one. No, yeah. because man, these guys—they—they uh, they are a uh, uh, rowdy bunch, shall we say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Surly leaves Whiskey Jack and Paran alone. Paran again says he wants to be a soldier. Whiskey Jack tells him he should only become a soldier if he fails at all else. 
that taking up the sword is the last act of a desperate man. Pran doesn't think Whiskey Jack sounds like other soldiers that he's spoken with. He says he sounds more like his father. And Whiskey Jack says, I'm not your father. <laughs> yeah. Paran's response, the world doesn't need another wine merchant. I, I thought that was really good. Yeah, it is. Yeah. He's a smart it always kid. needs plenty of soldiers, I guess. But yeah, yeah, I bet it does. <laughs> always made pretty a grist for the mill. So. Yeah. Do you think Paran wants to be a hero or is it simply he finds being a noble and their activities boring? I think it has a more, to, it's a little of both, but I think it's more to do with the activities of the nobles being born. Mm, yeah. The hero stories are also shiny. Yeah. Cause I think in particular, he says something at the, toward the end of chapter one, we'll cover later on that kind of makes me think more that that's what leads. Uh, it seems like there has been a lot more folks from the nobility moving in to the military seeking excitement or something like that would seem I think is what something I remembered. Right. And it, well, a lot of them go for an easy commission though, right? They, yes. they want to be yes. an officer in some cushy office in the Capitol and then, That's right. <laughs> then never see any combat. Right. A desk we job. will be exposed to plenty of these incompetent yeah, nobles absolutely. throughout the <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. This hostility is genuinely earned to a majority of them. Yep. And then one of my favorite things about this series is how that kind of self corrects <laughs> within the yes, ranks. It does. <laughs> yes, it does in a very the, brutal the way. The laws and soldiers are, <laughs> they don't take crap from anybody, including their <laughs> officers. <laughs> they don't take kindly to those that don't do it kindly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was there anything that you particularly liked about this prologue? You know, it, it's different this time for me because we, we've we started this in a different manner, starting together. So we're both probing a little bit deeper. So I'm approaching it a lot different. And uh, I, I, I'm liking, especially as we come later on, we, I'm, I'm liking a certain character more this read through. I never disliked him, but he always struck me as kind of haughty. And the more that I read him, he's less haughty than I realized. That was a little bit of my thinking of him parent um mm -hmm. but i just love that stuff on the parapet with surly and uh surly and whiskey jack and and that stuff is yeah <laughs> very intense yeah yeah the first time i read that i didn't pick up that intensity but once we get down the path of knowing who these people are and what they've done kind of and then as we start building and seeing how awesome they all are it's kind of like Wow, that is bold. You know, it's like because mm -hmm. this this read through has felt like wow, that's great. <laughs> yeah. What about you? I I did like the interaction between Whiskey Jack and Surly. It just what's interesting about it is he normally is such a a nice guy, yeah. and everybody loves him. And the the way you're introduced to him, he's hopping off to this character which isn't really how he is most of the time. No, I, I, no in fact, I don't remember him ever speaking to anybody else really like that. You know? No, he's usually not very hard. Like I said, he's a very compassionate. He's one of our, is, man, he's like one of the most compassionate people in the bridge partner, Sydney, in a weird way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cause I mean, he, uh, we're kind of jumping ahead here, but I mean, ultimately he kind of takes responsibility for all of them. He's their commander. Yeah, that's true. We're now in book one, pale. Yes. Chapter one. Chapter one begins in 1161 Burn Sleep. This is seven years after the prologue. Prior to the chapter, there's an entry from the Imperial Campaigns. The Maranth Alliance of 1156 is mentioned. This alliance causes a fundamental difference in the science of Malazan warfare. We'll discuss some of the changes later in book one. Yeah. At the beginning of the chapter, it is established that Lacine has been ruling the Malazan Empire for the last seven years. Basically, we saw her taken over. Yes. During the prologue. Yeah. We are now witnessing events in Itko Khan, which is on the southeast coast of the continent of Kwantali. Kwantali, again, is the core continent of the Malazan Empire and lies to the northwest of Malaz Island. A girl aged 13 and an old woman named Riga are standing on the road as a column of mounted Malazan soldiers ride past. 
Riga is talking about the husbands and fathers she has lost to the Malazan Empire. She makes a statement about the emperor prior to Lacine. Hood roast the bastard's soul on a spit. (laughs) (laughs) In the prologue, Whiskey Jack also said Hood's breath in response to a statement made by Paran about Dasim Ultor's death when it was supposed to be a secret. Hood is the god of death. Characters in these books will often cite gods in this universe when cursing or blessing a person or event, (laughs) often quite colorfully. Oh, yes. I've always enjoyed the swearing in these books because there's really not swearing by our standards. You know, Hood's toes Mm -hmm. or Hood's toenails or Hood's marble balls on an anvil. (laughs) Hood's moldering moccasins. Hood's breath we all covered. (laughs) But but the best one, I think, comes from it must. It's got to be Midnight Tides because it's it's Aaron's butthole. (laughs) <laughs> there's um so we'll come across th- this these wolf gods later it's tog and fandere yeah <laughs> and uh tog's teats yeah that's a big i hear one. that one quite a bit <laughs> the young girl expresses excitement at seeing the soldiers it is noted that the women writing in the column appear fiercer in a way than the men now this universe treats men and women very much as equals. There are some tough Marines we will meet that are female as well as some other extremely powerful women throughout the books. It's one of the things I really enjoy uh, um, amongst many of the things that Erickson does is he has some of my favorite female characters because you don't view them or tend to see them as female. It's not an impo- it's not an importance. It's and that and I appreciate that. It's just another soldier. Other writers always want to point out the differences between the sexes as just getting on with the story. And I have always appreciated that about this story. We just get on with it and difference because we've all understood what the differences for between men and women are. I like that we don't care here. Just move along. Tell the story. He does. Yeah. He does a really good job of building the world, making the people feel real. Yes. Like they live in the world because of his background, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Anthropologist, archaeologist. He designed the world in a way, and then the people that went in it are based off of the geography of where they're from. So you have yeah. jungle peoples, and they have the skin color of jungle peoples. Yeah. You know, you have people that live far in the north, and they're, you know, light-skinned yeah. with red hair. I mean, it's, it's very natural. It is. He's. It's just. I mean. It's so. Th- the thought that has gone into this just still staggers my imagination. I understand why people want to read it over and over. I mean, I'm enjoying reading it again, yet again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. Riga, the old woman, reaches out and grabs the girl's hair, pulling her close to her face. Riga tells the girl that Itko Khan was once free before the Malazan Empire conquered it. We will see the unification wars mentioned later in Book One of Gardens of the Moon. This will be referring to the Malazan campaign to unify all the peoples living on Kwan Tali. It, it was not always unified under the Malazan Empire. Yes. You know, this th- is not- they started on the island of Malaz and yeah. then they went from there and then they had to conquer the mainland there. Yeah. Riga is a wax witch and has some magical talent. She senses something is about to happen. A prophecy is loosed from her lips. Across the sea, the Empress has driven her knife into virgin soil. The blood now comes in a tide, and it'll sweep you under, child, if you're not careful. They'll put a sword in your hand, they'll give you a fine horse, and they'll send you across the sea. But a shadow will embrace your soul. Now listen. Bury this deep. Riga will preserve you because we are linked, you and I. But it is all I can do. Understand? Look to the Lord spawned in darkness. His is the hand that shall free you, though he knows it not. As Riga is finishing, one of the soldiers riding past notices the distress the girl is in and very callously smacks Riga on the side of the head with a gauntleted hand, killing her. That's a pretty rough treatment of the regular folk on the part of that soldier. It's a tough world they're living in. Yeah, You know, opposed to so many other (laughs) things I love about this world is opposed to so many other fantasy worlds that everything is always so pristine and cool and awesome. I want to go there and cure this world of this darkness. It's like this world is pretty, you know, it's like, it's, this is a beautiful world, but it's also a rough, rough world. Mm -hmm. It's tough. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's tough. Mm -hmm. The girl is in shock. And while recovering, we can see that she is speaking in a different voice than her own at times, almost like she has split personalities now. Once the column has ridden past, the girl is joined by two shadowy, wink, wink, <laughs> figures. 
She hadn't seen them before and asked where they came from. The taller of the two tells her the other side, which causes the shorter one to laugh. These two individuals can tell Riga had some weak talent with necromancy, noting she harbors five weak souls in her hut, which causes something in the girl's mind to cry out in anguish. The taller figure is named Cotillion, and the shorter, Aminus. We now see the first overt act of sorcery in the books. Aminus opens a rift, summoning seven hounds. Now, these aren't normal hound dog breeds. No. They are massive, the size of mules. Aminus sends them off after the mounted column. These two know Lacine, mentioning the pain she has caused them and that they are seeking revenge. Cotillion mentions Aminus has always underestimated the Empress, causing them to be in the situation that they are currently in. Given the girl knows their names, and the two know she would be questioned if they leave her alive, Cotillion makes a decision to use the girl for something that the Empress could never track down. The two discuss the fate of the girl's father. Cotillion insists they let him live and that greed should suffice as payment to the father for them taking the girl. Right. He assumes Aminus has the sorceress capability to do something to the father or for the father to make amends. Aminus giggles and states, beware of shadows bearing gifts. They also tell the girl, it's not such a bad thing to be the pawn of a god. And before she was set possessed, she says prod and pull. Um, Riga did, didn't she? Or was it? Or, no, she did. It, uh, not Riga, but the girl. No, I, I thought was it Riga? Riga said it first okay. and then. Uh, the girl says it after, oh, right. after Riga this. gets oh. killed. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, and this, yeah. When you were talking about kind of almost a split personality, I'll copy that. Copy that. Mm-hmm. Now this idea of gods using mortals, think back to the advice that whiskey Jap gave Peran. Yeah. Yeah. Common theme in these books. It very. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We are pawns. <laughs> As they're having this conversation, They can hear the screams from the column as the hounds are attacking. The girl is surrounded by shadows and her consciousness slips away. We are now introduced to a Malazan captain in Ikto Khan in the same region as the prior scene. He is welcoming the adjunct to the Empress. The adjunct is the Empress's hand, her servant, and the extension of her will. The captain is quite uncomfortable due to lack of action and him growing soft in the interim. The adjunct asks how long he's been posted in Itko Khan. 13 years, he says. He hasn't had to do much given the subjects are peaceful. He's unused to riding a horse. He mentions his, his vertebrae are crunching because he's not <laughs> yes. used to rolling in the saddle anymore. <laughs> Those little details, man. Yeah. You know, the, oh, the, yeah, throughout this whole scene, the, the strap on his helmet is chafing with his neck. He didn't shave. And, you know, his, his beard's getting caught in this, that. The, he's just, like, completely everybody is uncomfortable. So, yeah, everybody is so real. I mean, it's there's hardly any throwaway characters. I mean, even his throwaway characters are people. And it's so weird. Yeah. You know, because it, mm-hmm. I'm not. It's, it's a different level of detail. And, and you're right. It has to do with what he – it has to do with how he builds characters. Even his throwaway characters, he builds them from the ground up. <laughs> right. Now, this captain doesn't want to admit his discomfort to the adjunct or show her any sign of weakness. Her title alone has him nervous. The adjunct notes that he fought for the emperor and that he survived the purge of officers within the military. Apparently, Lacine has been disposing of anyone loyal to the emperor after she usurped him. The adjunct catches the captain admiring her figure and calls him out on it. <laughs> The captain notes the Khanese people didn't have all the mass riots and executions that hit the other parts of the empire during Lacine's takeover. The adjunct asks if he's a noble, to which the captain replies, even in Itko Khan, he wouldn't have survived the purge if he was a noble. The adjunct asks about his last engagement, and the captain says the Wiccan Plains. The Wiccan Plains are in the northeast corner of Quantali. And I can't wait until we get to talk about the Wiccans. Mm-hmm. They are absolutely incredible. Yeah. Some of my favorite characters. Yeah. Uh, think think of them as kind of a mix a little bit between like Mongolian horse lords or maybe Native American Dude. a little bit. It's a you, little bit ambiguous which yeah. they're closer to. It's kind of uh, they're I, plains people. They're right? plains people. Yeah. I th- I th- what's funny? I think I think you're a little closer with the Mongolian horse lords. I thought Native Americans at first too, but whatever that kind of nomadic. You know, it's the crow feathers that throws it out. Yeah. That, uh, because yeah. you generally associate crows with Native Americans. Yeah. 
I, well, I think that's what it is for me too. Speci- yeah, yeah. I Feathers, I should say. Yeah. I don't know if I don't know if it's crows specifically, but yeah. I mean, Mongolians have falcons. I don't know. Yeah, I just <laughs> I just had that that vibe. I do too. The Mongolian vibe. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. The adjunct wants to know how many men the captain had to use to contain the area of the incident. The captain replies, eleven hundred. Mm. This surprises the adjunct. The captain explains the carnage stretches one half league which is 1.5 miles from the sea and a quarter league inland. That's uh, about three quarters of a mile. As they ride into view of the carnage, the adjunct notes the haunted expressions in the eyes of the Malazan veterans. Now these veterans served in the siege of Li Hang, which is in the center of the continent of Kwantali. And they also served in the Wiccan wars, which took place on the Wiccan plains. They have seen war and are still scarred by what they see in the carnage. Wow. The killing field is covered in gulls and crows feasting on the remains of the Malazan regiment. 175 people and 210 horses. The ground is red as far as the eye can see. The captain notes the dead were only Malazan. No enemy casualties were found. All inhabitants of the town were also killed, including women, children, and livestock, numbering 400 more casualties. This is where the reader is introduced to the brutality of this series. People will die, and in great numbers, often in a gruesome manner. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there will be characters that you love. Sometimes it's going to hurt. Yes, it's going. Yes, I'm so sorry. Yes, this will hurt. But in order for you to get hurt, they had to be good characters to begin with. Amen. Yeah. So... It's yeah. part of the price of really it finding out about of, those good characters. Absolutely. You got your heart ripped out. Yeah. <laughs> I've been reduced to tears multiple times in this series. I, I've contemplated what I'm going to do when I get to some parts of this, whether I'm going to be able to get through it without, you know, kind of breaking Chugging. down a little bit because yeah. it's going to be, or is it going to be like where the red fern grows when I was in middle school and my teacher was <laughs> sobbing when she's reading <laughs> like about <laughs> the dogs, you know? <laughs> oh. Yeah. Oh. Good stuff traumatizing youth from <laughs> i'm sorry I, I was i was sought out i sought out trauma from a young age dude i was reading weird stuff from about the first and second grade on dude yeah i think uh fifth grade i was reading stephen king nice so i read a, i was reading i don't, I don't know that it was this, necessarily traumatizing but i, I read poe or i had poe read to us in halloween speaking of the tis of the season but uh the telltale heart when i was in second grade and that oh, gave me wow. nightmares yeah I was like, oh, this is a uh, love it. for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would think wow. so. But yeah, it could kind of turn me on to that kind of weird stuff. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We are reintroduced to Lieutenant Genoes Peran, <laughs> now age 19, as he catches the eye. Of- and probably the last time we'll say that name. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> As he catches, oh, so we're reintroduced to him now, age 19, as he catches the eye of the adjunct as he is guiding his horse through the killing field. The adjunct, who has identified herself as Lorne to the captain, now recognizes the name Paran as nobility. The captain calls Paran up and asks for a report of his findings. Lorne notes the effect the day has had on Paran's appearance. It has worn on him. Paran identifies the huts on the other side of the killing field all had casualties but two those belonging to Riga and the girl. He was able to determine this through some deductive reasoning. Riga's body was found on the side of the road with some candles, and they found remnants of candles in one of the huts. The girl and her father were still missing, though their boat was still moored. Lorne's line of questioning exhibits a strong ability to see the evidence and guide her investigation. She asks about the weapons that killed everyone. Paran notes natural weapons, very large teeth. The captain notes the lack of wolves on Itko Khan, and Paran knows these wolves would have had to have been massive to match up to the bite marks. Paran also notes the lack of hair or footprints. Lorne asks Paran to guide her to the other side of the killing field. She begins a conversation with him to distract herself. When Lorne asks Paran if he has received his commission yet, we see a bit of arrogance and naivete in his answer, as he tells Lauren, he has not received his commission, but he would have it arranged to be in the capital. That's pretty mm-hmm. forward. Pretty. Yeah, I'm just going to have it done. You know. Yeah, <laughs> it's just going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Lauren notes that the nobles have refrained from this type of action in the empire for a long time. Pran states when the emperor was in power, this was the case. But Lacine seems to care less about the nobles since her attention lies elsewhere. Lauren thinks Pran is being presumptuous 
in relation to his plans. Side note here, there's an important component of the success of the Malazan Empire, mm. allowing it to spread rather quickly. The emperor would cull the nobility when conquering a region to please the masses. Yeah, brutally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll see some of that in Dead House Gates mm -hmm. in practice. Your favorite, yes. That's my favorite book, yep. Yeah, that's a, that's a, oh, what a great opening to, to that book. That's a, harsh, mm -hmm. that's a harsh entrance into that book. <laughs> yep. Lorne comments on how young Paran is based on his answer. Paran responds by relaying what he has been experiencing in the killing field all day, how it has changed his perspective on things, stating, I'm not young anymore, adjunct. As for presumption, I honestly couldn't care less. Truth can't be danced around. Not out here, not now, not ever again. After chewing on the statement for a time, Lauren tells Paran his words were well-spoken and that he won't be stationed in Unta, but will be assigned to Lauren's staff as a commissioned officer. <laughs> Paran asks for an explanation of what happened. We see Lauren's power of deduction as she explains to Paran her thoughts on the events, noting it as a diversion to hide the fact that the girl and her father were missing. We also begin to understand exactly what the adjunct does. Paran comments on her being a mage hunter. The adjunct is anathema to sorcery, and we will find out how later. Yep. Lauren orders Paran to go inquire about the girl and her father in the town of Garum where they would have gone to sell their catch. They both ride back to the captain, and Lauren tells him, much to the captain's liking, that Paran will be assigned to her detail. <laughs> and we see the attitude of the Malazan enlisted soldier towards the nobility here. Oh, yeah. They despise him. Yeah. <laughs> the adjunct gives him some orders to look for newly enlisted people that fall in the age range and genders of the girl or her father. After Paran leaves, Lorne asks the captain about how the nobility is faring in the Malazan military command structure. The captain notes it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> we switch to the Malazan recruiting drive. The recruiter has received a description of the girl and her father and recognizes the girl when she comes to enlist. He notes her age and that her eyes look much older than they should. She knows exactly where she wants to be assigned, to the Ginnabakan campaign under High Fist Dujek One Arm. He gets a headache as she is talking to him, and his mind seems kind of foggy. He asks what her name is. She gives it as Sorry. As she's leaving, he notes the mud on her feet, though it hasn't rained in some time. Also that the mud was red, not matching the mud from this geographical region. The headache clears after she leaves. These are not the droids you're looking for. These are not the droids you're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> Nicely done. A little too. sorcery going on there. Yeah. Back to Paran as he enters Garum, he finds nothing but death there. All members of the Malazan constabulary killed and surrounded by pigeons seemingly summoned to obscure the trail. The documentation in the office also has been destroyed via sorcery. He leaves. We get to see a little bit of introspection from Paran as he takes stock of his situation and the decisions that he's made. He thinks his family will be impressed with his new assignment. Many noble-born sons and daughters seem to have their sights on careers in the Malazan military command structure, given their boredom with the lives of their noble families. There's what I was talking about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That answers my question. Yeah. Yeah. He received little to no respect in his posting in Itkokan, given his lack of combat experience and his noble blood. His volunteering to lead the inspection detail at the site of the carnage may have changed some of that, but a lot of the composure he showed could be attributed to the behavior of his horse since it wasn't too disturbed by the killing field due to its breeding. The detail had taken a toll on him mentally, particularly the killing of the horses. I want to say something real quick here about his horse, his horse versus, because there's a distinction talking about her horse. She talks about her horse being shy. Yeah. Uh, she is shying through some of that stuff and her horse is a war horse had been bred through generations and his, she was kind of real shy around that his horse was carefully picking it through there but he was able I think he was able to coax more of that horse too because of breeding of being a horse breeder probably yeah he was leaning forward and kind of whispering in its ears a little bit yeah yeah so he knows you know he's good he's good with them mm -hmm. yeah the detail had taken a toll on him mentally particularly the killing of the horses yeah as he's remembering the carnage, he remembers old words from Whiskey Jack, live quietly. 
Now, these words had a big impact on him for him to be remembering them still this many years later. Yeah. He rejected them then, and he still rejects them. Yeah. He's a hard-headed fella. Yeah. <laughs> mm. He hasn't seen enough bad stuff yet, but he's getting it, there. He's getting there. He gets there quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perrin's thoughts are interrupted when a man appears on the road in front of him. The man is wearing all green and has rings on all of his fingers, above and below the knuckles. His weapon is a long knife, the knife of choice in seven cities. Aged about 30, his hair is white. It is noted that he is half Tist Andy. The Tist Andy have been mentioned in the Imperial Campaign extract before the chapter, specifically that there are regiments from Moon's Spawn. They are an elder race, long-lived, and are recognized by their onyx skin and white hair. One thing that stuck out to me here is he's only 30 years old. He appears, does it say he's aged or does he appear aged 30? Aged about 30. I mean, it's definitely appearance. It's appearance. So I'm assuming he does age slower. Oh, true. Yeah, because he's he's, he's half blood. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'm assuming he does age, though, but. Because if he's human, but he would age, he would he probably last a lot longer than we would normally. So he could be a lot older, but he, but it, we don't know much about him. We will get to know a little bit about him. He's he's one of these characters I like a lot because he's not a rumor almost. <laughs> you see him here. He's a, I mean, you don't see him a whole lot. I can't remember seeing him a whole lot. Here, but when you hear him, you're like, oh, Topper. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. He introduces himself as Topper, a name which Paran recognizes. Topper is here to escort Perrin to Unta at the behest of the adjunct. Topper was the claw assassin that eliminated the entire Untan royal line. All of it. Up to and including third cousins. Mm. That's pretty hardcore. Yeah, it is. Unta lies on the east side of Quan Tali. It is the current capital of the Malazan Empire. This is one of the examples of the Malazan Empire's methodology for conquest. Cut off the head, call the nobility. Paran displays his contempt for Topper in his speech, understandable given his noble blood and the fact that his family lives in Unta. Is Paran's contempt for the claw in general, or do you think he lost to distant relations, you know, second and third cousins? And that uh... It's very high probability that he lost some family members, but I mean, he... Probably feels it's like a direct attack on his class, right? That, absolutely. That would be. Yeah. Both are possible, right? right? Yeah. I'm assuming especially the nobility ha- would have a lot of, you know, a lot of marriages and stuff like that that would, I'm like, for political advan- advantages and whatnot. So I would, assume, that's, that's kind of what I was thinking when he said that. It's like, oh, he probably, that's why he has more contempt for the claw than usual. And maybe he just thinks back, maybe he thinks back to when he was a kid. And this may be Whiskey Jack's contempt for Lucene slash Surly at that point. Maybe that just rubbed off mm. on him too. Yeah, I mean, he already had a general idea of what he thought of the Claw. He was terrified of them. Yeah. So he knew who they were prior to seeing them. Yeah, at 12, yeah. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. Topper is attempting to have a civil conversation with Paran, though Paran shows no attempt at reciprocation. <laughs> This interchange in particular is interesting. Paran says, whatever arrangement you made with the adjunct is between you and her. I owe you nothing, Topper, except for enmity. Topper's response, ancient wounds. I was led to understand you've taken a different path, leaving behind the dull, jostling ranks of the nobility. You are now one with the body of the empire, Lieutenant. It commands you. You respond unquestioningly to its will. You are a small part of the muscle in that body of empire. No more, no less. The time for old grudges is long past. Topper asks if he may call Paran by his chosen name, to which Paran replies, Paran will do. (laughs) I'll take it. (laughs) (laughs) Paran asks what title the commander of the claw holds. Topper corrects him, stating Lacine still commands the claw. Topper is simply an aide of sorts. Her male secretary. Right. It's pretty, it's, 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 she's not Ashley. Yeah. <laughs> this guy has a lot more brains yeah, on him. That's Ashley from The Boys for anyone that didn't watch that show. Sorry, oh, yeah. New check, check out excruciating details. Yeah. Pran asked Topper if he wants to know what he found in Garum, 
then decides to wait to tell the adjunct. Topper commends him, stating, You have begun to learn, Paran. Never be too easy with the knowledge you possess. Words are like coin. It pays to hoard. Paran's response, until you die on a bed of gold. And I love that response. It's definitely a powerful insight by him. Both the fact that he's learning to keep his mouth shut and how keeping secrets in the long run may not be the best play. Yeah. What is the worth of all of that gold that you're hoarding if you die and it's not spent? Yeah, I agree. It's, it's pointless. It's useless. Is that? I love it. Yeah. And you're yeah. right. Quite the insight. And in this case, the gold is information. Yes. Right. It's not gold, gold. Yeah. But I mean, similar principle with gold. gold Absolutely. Too, you can't take it with you. Yeah. <laughs> The conversation is interrupted by their path appearing. A tear appears in the middle of the air, opening into a warren. Warrens are like alternate dimensions. They can be accessed by a gateway opened with sorcery. Warrens can have aspects like fire, light, dark, shadow, air, etc. They can be used to travel quickly between continents, a few hours for 300 leagues, about 900 miles. And that's on foot. Yeah, the it's very impressive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the warren they're about to enter is named the Imperial Warren. And to my knowledge, it does not have an aspect. I think that is correct. Because a post I read put it like this, you know, it's it's just one of these weird pocket things. That mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll find out in, it's before one of the books. Yes. It's like a prologue it, it, to it one, of the, one of the books. Yeah. It spells out exactly what it is. We're not going to get into it now because it's related to some characters we haven't been introduced. Yeah. And it's also to really yet. too early uh, for other yeah. concepts that don't need to be mentioned. <laughs> yeah. Topper mentions the Warren was carved by force out of what was there before. What that was, we'll find out in a later book, like I said. Once in the Warren, the rift closes behind them, showing the trail that they are on stretches behind them. They are surrounded by ash everywhere. Paran says, I take it then that no god claims this warren. By this you cheat the tolls, the gatekeepers, the guardians or unseen bridges, and all the others said to dwell in the warrens in service to their immortal masters. Topper has a glib response calling Paran ignorant for believing the warrens are as crowded as that. And he's now kind of acting pissy topper yeah. because Paran was rude to him at yeah. the, when they were, when yeah. they first met. They come upon some signs of activity in the ash, a stain and scattered links of chain mail. Topper hurries their pace after that, showing his bravado may have been a front. There are dangerous things here and he doesn't want to tangle with them. You know, I love how we rarely never, I wouldn't say never, but rarely see what goes on in here, but the hints at these things are always just, Part of the thing I love, I love these weird questions I have about, well, what goes on in here? <laughs> yeah. You know, what, very... what's pulling these people off here? Or do I, I don't want to really know, but I do want to know if he wants to write a story about it. I think he could write a whole, I'm sure he could write a whole series about what goes on inside Warren's. <laughs> I mean, it's basically like alternate dimensions. Yeah. You could do whatever you wanted with That's it. That's right. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. As Paran and Topper are making way th their way through the Warren Paran keeps goading Topper in their back and forth conversation. Finally, they reach an arch that looks new built from Unten basalt and has a sigil of the Malazan empire on it. There is darkness beyond. Now this scene coming up is absolutely great. It is one of the standouts in book one for me. Yeah, me too. I agree. It's fantastic. Really funny. Really, really, really good. Everything. <laughs> Topper has gone through the portal and Paran tries to lead his horse through, but it refuses to go. He has to mount it and spur it on through the gate. When he lands, he finds himself in an ornate room, gold ceiling, mosaic tiles with semi-precious gems on the floor. <laughs> Guards are closing in on all sides in alarm and the horse sidesteps and knocks Topper to the side and sends a kick at him, causing him to have to dodge. I love that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that hoof being shot. I know it. He doesn't even like the guards. <laughs> the guards retreat, and Paran finds he is in the Empress's throne room. 
<laughs> she is seated on a throne of twisted bone. Paran grimaces, realizing what has happened. He dismounts and bows before the Empress. She looks largely the same as he, the last time he saw her. The Empress notes that Paran didn't heed Whiskey Jack's advice from seven years ago, surprising Paran. Lacine also notes that Whiskey Jack didn't heed the advice given him either. She wonders what god put them on that parapet together, and that she must acknowledge their sense of humor. And this is a fantastic question in and of itself, but man, what a memory on that gal. I mean, he was a little boy. Oh, yes. I mean, mm -hmm. he's seven a years. Boy. Yes. She's running an empire. Yes. And she remembers something like that. Yes. That's amazing. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Love mm -hmm. it. She asks if Paran thought the arch and the warren would lead to the stables. Paran apologizes to her, noting the horse is bred for its intelligence, <laughs> unlike Paran himself. <laughs> Lucine tells Paran Topper will lead him to the adjunct. I love that smooth answer. And, man, <laughs> I, and it kind of, I think it kind of earns a little bit of a smile from her, doesn't it? Ah, uh, he does. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. That's his noble training right yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Smooth, yeah. It's smooth. It's all, it's just drilled into him. Mm hmm. Topper is upset and verbally lashes out at Paran. He also wants to know about the interchange between Paran and Lassine, specifically what Lassine was talking about, if Paran has met Lassine before and when it happened. Paran says, since she declined to explain, I can only follow her example. What a lip. I love the lip. <laughs> yeah, and I think it was at this moment I realized, man, on this read-through, I'm really liking oh, him more this time. You know I love him. Um, I don't remember liking him this much in previous read-throughs, but just he's popping off left and right. I usually don't like him until like well he until way later, to where he becomes more mm -hmm. important. But this time, I feel like I, I, it's just something about it. It's like wow, just something I missed. I don't know how I missed how much I liked him. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the great thing about this series is you find new things every time you look at it. Well, there's a lot to look at. Definitely. I mean, we've also changed too, right? Yeah. It's been 10 years since we read it the first time. Yes. So our views have changed as well. Oh. Yeah. Paran follows Topper's instructions and finds himself in the adjunct's room at the top of the tower. Paran relays what he found in Garum, the obscured trail and that Death's Herald was pigeons. The locals would be unlikely to talk. Lacine could send in a necromancer, but the dead would only see pigeons. Paran realizes how tired he is. No, this has all happened in one day for him. Yeah. From the killing fields to this moment. That's a lot. Yeah. That's well, he, a lot for one day. Think about it. He does that. He's ridden to that town. He's gotten to a verbal spouring match with an assassin. He's probably killed some of his distant cousins. And then he's come about a thousand miles to wind up at the throne room. Yeah, and not to mention he went through his first warren, yeah. which probably was pretty scary. Oh, I mentioned that would be horrifying. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. knowing what's that going on. That one in particular, yeah. with all that ash. Yes, that's, mm -hmm. I don't know why that, well, that one, well, I know why it creeps me out, but. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want to know what lives, what what lives in these things? Because, I mean, things do things move here? Do things, are they drawn to them? I don't know. It never answers these things. Yeah. These are just questions I ask. Do you ask these questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think. I don't know. I don't know that I've asked that specific question, but I do have questions. Right. Paran's so tired, he begins to nod off, and Lauren wakes him up, telling him to pay attention since she is discussing his future. Yeah. Paran did his task well and proved resilient. Outwardly, Lauren will be done with him, but he will have a series of postings which will be strategic. They will continue to follow the trail, but not too closely. Lauren instructs Paran to go home and get rest while awaiting his orders. As Paran is walking the street of the city he grew up in, he finds the sights familiar, but the he has changed, causing him to feel outcast. He knows the difference between seeing the world as a noble at a distance from the commonry, always guarded and never jostled among the populace, a gift and a curse. He no longer has the noble power of blood, only the armor of an imperial soldier, one among thousands in the empire. He gets to his house, and the guard recognizes him from a family tapestry. Paran quips whether it was being used as a rug in the guard's barracks, and the guard says something like that. <laughs> oh, I, I love that. It's like, and I love how he brings Gamut in. I didn't, you know, so early. Yeah. Even Gamut we, is yeah. a notable character much later. Much later. Mm-hmm. 
The guard is identified as a veteran of some sort and is named Gamut. Paran is in the feast hall, and we're introduced to his younger sister, Tavora. She is a year younger than Ganoes, making her 18. <laughs> she has short hair, not in the style that is popular, and is described as having a plain appearance. Man, I notice, notice the tension between them, these two already. They're both equally mm-hmm. strong characters, as we learn later. Do you think Tavora has already been spotted by the Empress? Even though, I mean, I know Lorne is still in the picture, but for having the Empress remember who Perrin is, do you think she's been watching these these kids? It's hard to say. This is two years before the events in Genabacus. And I, I want to say Tavora takes the position to redeem the honor of House Perrin in the eyes of the Empire. Right. Okay. Now we're kind of getting into spoilerish territory. Yeah. So I won't go to a whole lot deeper, but yeah. But mm-hmm. uh, I was just kind of curious because uh, it's yeah. like I had not, I, I, but that's also, you're right, colored by, you know, re, having, knowing what's in the future on the series. I forget, right. I forget a lot of details, but I don't forget the general stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Since Ganoes went to the military, the affairs of the family have been taken on by Tavora. They have a younger sister named Felicin. <laughs> Paran asks if Felicin is her rival now. Tavora notes Felicin is too soft for this or any other world. She also mentions Felicin will be happy to see that he has returned and then crushed when she learns that he will be leaving soon. Tavora leaves and Paran watches her leave, noting her stiff back. He looks around the room and thinks it is much smaller than he remembers. And that is how chapter one ends. Do you have any standout moments in here? Welcome to your introduction. Oh, yeah. You know, it's kind of funny because I think certain chapters are going to stand out more than others. But for an introduction, there's quite a few standouts. I mean, just his introduction. Well, first off, just the introduction to uh, the shadowy characters who we, you know, Aminus and Cotillion, and them unleashing the hounds, which we didn't really Mm -hmm. see it until you see the results of it. So uh, Perrin's intro to the adjunct, straight shooting right out of the gate. And to the right hand of the Empress, you got to admire that. Mm-hmm. And um, I like them also at the recruitment office. I mean, especially like you said, this is one day. I mean, the pigeons and the corpses. I mean, this world is so layered. And these things take on a more sinister tone for me the more I read these books. Because you realize all this layering that he's been doing. I mean, I'm blown away. I, I, I'm, I'm, it, this never ceases to amaze me, his interconnectedness between his books, as you will start to learn to see people. Yeah, the seeds that are planted well, well in advance. Yes. Yeah. I really like the conversation between Topper and Paran. Yeah. Paran's sassiness was incredible. I mean, he especially when he starts goading him. Yes. You know, oh, it's just beautiful. I love it. I do too. And I, I, I love that whole scene. And, and I want to know what's been drug off. <laughs> does, 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 <laughs> does, 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 Esselon, does he not cover this or does he just – I know he covers some things that because I have read a little bit of that stuff. I think I'm a uh, – I forget which one of those I'm on. I'm on the one where they're on Jackaruka. I kind of got bogged down in that one uh, in the jungle. Yeah, that one's a little bit slow. I don't recall him ever mentioning th- specifically this case, right, right, of what is in this warren. But right. there are multiple entries and exits to this warren throughout the series. Yes. And I think we do get some insight into some other stuff that's in here. Yeah. I know that we do Not only where it came from, but also other stuff happening in here. Right. I think, oh, yeah. I think we, oh, yeah. The answer's, oh, yeah. Okay. Then, uh, so, uh, but, but I love parents. Ent- Me and you both, I know we both, we already said it already, the entrance into the throne room. And for a 19 year old, talk about grace under fire, dude. Grace <laughs> under pressure, just straight up. Mm-hmm. That whole scene yeah. is beautiful. Yeah. The fact that, the horse tries to kick top. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everything. <laughs> to add insult to injury. I, and well, then you, you, the the hooves are smashing precious gemstones yes, on the yes. floor. <laughs> yes. And, and the Empress is, and, and there's something about the Empress I like too, even though we grow to, I, you know, I never grow to hate this woman. She feels very necessary. I feel, you know, she's a very unusual character. You know, I don't know how to. I hate her for a short time, but yes. then some things happen that kind of turn that around a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because up to a certain point, we're we're led to believe that she's the cause of a lot of bad stuff. Yeah, and she might be. I have to I have to kind yeah. of dig in deeper and see if that 
that is true. So yeah, I like parent returning home and to find and finding things are changing, and the tension mm-hmm. between the sibling takes on a new meaning for me as well as well each read through. Yeah, I do like that intro to Tavora. Yeah, it's very on brand for her. her yeah, the way she acts. Yeah, very much so. Because mm-hmm. I kind of forget about seeing her at first. You, know, you forget because this is, I love that these people you're introduced to, them, but that's it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, it wasn't the fastest start. It does have some pretty, so you got some intrigue going on. Yeah. The things will pick up big time. Yeah. Next We're about chapter. To, yeah. Next chapter. I mean, like I said, and don't, do not be afraid of this stuff, man. This is a, this is, um, this is well worth, this is well worth the read even though it's hard and it can be difficult it's well it's worth not it. hard it's not hard it's amazing dude please yeah, yeah we're and and we're here to make it easier that's right that's our job so yeah. thank you for listening to our first episode yes thank you and we will see you next time yep. we thank you all for joining us today again we really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today if you would like to support our show you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com where you can find our patreon link Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.